Hi everyone, Molten here. Welcome back to our Khan Repertoire series part two. In this one, I'm going to be covering the dreaded Meroxy bind, which everyone hates to face. And our weapon of choice against it is going to be the Hedgehog Formation, which if I was to describe in two words, I would say it's passive aggressive for black, where you sort of build your position and wait for the perfect opportunity to uh, strike and look for counterplay. So white plays move pawn to c4 in this position, starting the Meroxy bind grabbing space and stopping a lot of our pawn breaks and our formation goes as follows we put the knight on f6, queen to c7 pawn goes to b6 to allow our bishop to fianchetto here we'll look at a couple of different options for white for example the main one would be pawn to f3 and there are some other options for example queen to d3 is quite an annoying one to face and I will give you what I think is the best remedy against that when white tries to go for f4 in this particular video but after the move pawn to f3 d6 bishop to e3 this will be our main position which uh, most people will reach and from here i'm going to show you a couple of different useful ideas how you can proceed with black and yeah it's going to be um, very very interesting to follow through and also um, i'll show you a couple of different useful move order tricks which you can use against your opponents for example one very early on on move 5, if your opponent plays the move bishop to d3 here, instead of playing bishop to c5, which is one of the moves I suggested in my previous video, you could opt for knight f6 instead. And for example, in one particular game, my opponent played pawn to b3, pawn to d6, bishop to b2, and instead of going bishop to e7 here, I actually opted for the move pawn to g6, castles, bishop g7, knight d2, castles, and as you'll see in a lot of positions, um, often the bishop will actually reroute back from e7 and go into a fianchetto type of setup anyway to defend against possible kingside attacks so doing it straight away saves you a lot of time but otherwise i'm going to go through a few examples with you in this particular video so like comment subscribe if you have any feedback otherwise i guess i hope you guys enjoy the examples i'll see you very soon Okay, so let's start with our first idea from the black side. In this particular position, black plays the move rook a to c8, which is a very common theme. As you'll see, in a lot of positions, the queen will actually drop back to b8, and moving this rook out of the way first is um, an important move to include. After the move bishop to f1, black plays the move queen to b8. As for the other rook, it often either sits on e8 or d8, but the reason why we're not moving it yet is first we want to play this particular maneuver with the bishop. For example, after queen f2, black can play the move bishop to d8. We're trying to bring the bishop to a much better square here on c7, where it eyes the white king side. For example, king h1, bishop goes to c7. In this particular game, white played the move queen g1. Now the reason why we set up this bishop and queen battery in a lot of positions is that one key move for black is to play the move pawn to d5 to break open the center at the right opportunity and that would eye up this h2 pawn you'll see why this is important later on but getting back to our first idea in this particular setup that is an idea i think introduced by fisher or made well known by fisher in one particular game actually from opposite colors but he played the move king to h8 the idea is to move the rook across to g8 after the move pawn to b4. White goes for the queenside counterplay, which is the usual plan. Black plays the move rook to g8, preparing the move pawn to g5, g4. And this is by far one of my favorite plans to play as black in the hedgehog. It works very, very well when white plays the move pawn to f3. When white plays the move pawn to f4, of course, it, um, it's much harder to get in. But after the move knight to b3 here, we can play the move pawn to g5. The game continued, pawn to h3, rook to g6, bishop to d3. Trying to go for some pawn to e5 break. Black doesn't care, black plays the move rook c to g8. And now after the move pawn to e5, actually it looks like it's winning for white because white is hitting the knight here on f6 and the white bishop is opening up an attack on the rook on g6 so it looks like he's going to win some material but you'll see later on how 
this position where it looks quite passive for black with all these pieces on the back rank actually comes to life after the move rook to h6. Now all of a sudden white is unsure what is happening. I mean, white just takes the knight, doesn't really see what is going on, and then see if you can spot the winning move here from black. So black plays the move, rook takes h3. This completely blows up the king side. For example, after the move pawn recaptures, we have the move bishop takes f3. And now after the move king g2, which is the only move because otherwise white would have to have lost the queen, black plays this fantastic move pawn to d5. And now we see the bishop and queen are actually extremely important part of the game. So this is actually quite common in the hedgehog where the position sort of is sleeping for a while and then all of a sudden it comes to life. So rook g8 is a very, very useful idea and one of my most, um, let's say, uh, my, my favorite one, I would say. So next idea, which is very, very common, and you'll see this used um, quite a lot. The whole point of putting the bishop and queen battery on this diagonal is to prepare this particular move. Here it's a central pawn break. Black plays the move pawn to d5, hitting out in the center. But the reason why it works really well here is because with the rook on e8, you'll see that this e3 square is actually guarded. So then black will often play the bishop out to f4 and white won't be able to, to block it with bishop to e3. So let's say a few points exchange. Black plays the move bishop to f4. Useful in between move, bishop to e3. Now I suppose black could consider taking the pawn on h2. That might be also an option, but pawn takes, uh, but bishop takes here on e3 is probably simpler. Takes here and we get a lot of simplification, but the simplifications help black because it opens up the position in our favor. So he takes on c4 takes and he could have played the move knight to e5 here with uh, the black side. And for example, just to show you what could happen from here, let's say white moves the bishop back to e2. Let's say black plays the move point to h6. I just want to highlight the different ideas here. Let's say white doesn't see the tactics here in this position and grabs this pawn on b6 with the queen. Uh, I want you to stop and pause the video if you want to try and work this out. It is black to move and find the best move for black. So for those of you who spotted this tactic with the move knight to g4, well done. So the idea is that again this queen on b8 is absolutely hitting this um, h2 pawn and it's um, getting into the game again. Here, for example, if, if white plays the move rook to d6, then black can win immediately with the nice move rook to c6. And since white is pinned, he can't capture the rook without allowing a checkmate on h2. If the queen goes to d6 to try and block our diagonal, then we can play the move knight to f2 check. And this is very strong, we win the exchange. And if they try to capture the knight, then you can see this bishop again comes into the game. Bishop takes g2, king takes, and we win the queen on b6. So d5, a very important theme. Like in a lot of these positions, you'll see the move pawn to d5 being played um, to break open the center. So in our third game, I chose an example which comes from, I believe, a time on of type of position which transposed into a type Meroxy bind. Here the pieces are on slightly different squares and I just want to highlight this idea that if you get the hedgehog from a slightly different move order and let's say your knight ends up on c6 instead of d7 it's actually misplaced on this square and what you should do is try to reroute it back to d7. For example in this particular position black played the move knight to e5 f3, castles, white played queen to b3, and then rerouted back the knight to d7. And the reason why you want your knight on d7 apart 
for, uh, not on c6 is on c6 when you do play queen c7 in a lot of positions white will stick a rook on c1 and then you'll have some problems with knight d5 and this pin will open up on the c file so it's much better to have the knight on d7 so rook d1 queen c7 rook c1 rook a c8 so we've seen all this before king h1 in this particular game black played the move rook f to e8 white played the move knight to b1 and again we have many different plans here from black again he could have easily played king h8 and gone rook to g8 g5 that was one plan we saw he could have also tried to set up d5 that was another plan here we look at the third option which is the move pawn to h5 just marching up the h pawn to try and create some weaknesses in white's kingside positioning if we're allowed to we will play h4 h3 just to soften up the white kingside or try to get him to maybe play h3 and maneuver our knight to h5 to g3 and play on some squares there if we're given the chance now the game continued pawn to a3 queen to b8 bishop to f2 and here black was able to use the h pawn to generate some um, tactical chances after the move pawn to h4 it looks like the pawn can be captured but it's actually walking into a couple of different tactics for example after the move bishop takes black played the move knight to c5 so as black here we're looking for opportunities to create some complications in our favor if we can and really if, if we can target these two pawns that would be most favorable in this position white didn't take this pawn on on um, b6 because i believe the queen is very short on squares and might actually even get trapped uh, not to mention knight d7 i think is also winning the bishop opening up a discovered attack on the queen and bishop queen moves we take the bishop that's why white played to move queen to a2 and here we have a tactic with black side see if you can spot the tactic which wins our material back black to move so here black plays the move knight takes e4 so after the move knight takes e4 we're opening up an attack on this bishop but if the bishop captures our bishop then we do have in between moves so if bishop captures we do have this in between check for example and then we can capture the rook first before we recapture the bishop which would leave us material up now if knight takes e4 in the game knight takes e4 again the same thing if, if pawn takes knight we capture the bishop if bishop takes we have this in between check and then we capture the rook and the idea here by white is that he's trying to trap the knight on on d1 so it can't move but black plays this pawn break with pawn to d5 getting the pieces into the game we've seen this idea before after the move bishop to d1 now the queen comes out to e5 and we see black is very very active here with threatening checkmate on e1 the bishop is also hanging white does have two pieces for the rook which is usually good but in this position his pieces are not in play, they're slightly passively placed as well. So bishop to d2, we have to move pawn takes c4. Rook takes c4, bishop to d5 was played. Takes, takes. And now in this position, black found another fantastic move. So I want you to, again, pause the video if you want to try and work it out. It is black to play. What did black play in this particular position? So black has the move, rook to c1 here. So excellent, excellent move. Hitting this um, bishop on d1, and if the bishop captures, then we have back rank mate with queen to e1. So instead what happened was knight to c3 was played, but this gives black a chance to win the material back if he wants to. He can actually just capture the knight, and I think the resulting position is slightly better for him. He opted for a better continuation, I think. First with queen to d4, king f1. And then he actually played this move, bishop takes b3, which is, again, another 
another blow to white's position because hitting the bishop because of the pin he can't capture it so he had to go queen takes but now he drops the bishop on d2 queen takes b6 and he loses the knight and um, everything is dropping here so again we, we see how the position is quiet for a time and after a few moves all of a sudden everything changes and this is very very um, common for many hedgehog games okay let's move on to our next one okay so in this particular hedgehog position we see that white has actually fiancated the bishop so sometimes you can't always use the plans that we learnt in the previous examples so you need to adjust in this particular position we can't use that so i'm going to show you another idea which involves fiancating your bishop to g6 and putting the bishop on g7 so as i mentioned with the move order you can actually fiancating the bishop straight from the beginning and sometimes it's actually good to do that because it saves you time later on g4 happened in this particular game h6 but the ideas will still stay the same i mean black is looking for pawn breaks with d5 with f5 with b5 so in this type of position here black is going to be looking for mainly d5 and b5 i would guess queen goes to g3 we have to move knight to c5 black is putting some pressure on this e pawn we'll see why so after bishop to a1, white is waiting, and here black finally hits out with the move pawn to e5. Going for another pawn break in this position with knight c2 and b5. So this is another key pawn break that you, you want to always be on the lookout for. Hitting the c4 pawn and softening up white's um, central position. For example here, if, if white captures, which is what happened, then black actually captured here on e4 using some tactics again to make this move work the idea being that now that the knight is on c2 if white captures everything let's say bishop takes we have bishop takes rook takes and we can actually capture the knight here and as the position opens up more it becomes more in black's favor Actually, you even have a better move here. You might even be able to play rook takes c2, which is even stronger because if rook takes here, then you have bishop takes hitting the rook and um, the king at the same time. There's lots of tactics here white has to be careful of. That's why you played the move queen to d3, and the game continued knight to c5, queen takes d6, which is actually a blunder because in this position, black is already winning. Black has the move rook e to d8 here which is i believe what white missed in the game and after this move we're taking the rook with check with the skewer so in between check and then we recapture the queen with extra material okay so last thing i'm going to move on to what i think is probably the most annoying idea to face and that is the move queen to d3 in this position now the idea of queen to d3 is in a lot of positions white will actually find it more useful to put the pawn on f4 than on f3 because it just grabs a lot more space and it's a lot of a lot more difficult for black to implement a lot of the ideas that i showed you in um, the first half of the video so after the move queen to d3 white is also sometimes threatening queen to g3 to trade off these queens and get into a slightly better ending you can play the move pawn to d6 here and go straight into a hedgehog for example let's say after pawn to f4 knight to d7 pawn to b4 white grabs a lot of space bishop to e7 bishop to e3 castles rook to c1 you can play into this it it is um playable but i would say that it's a lot harder um for most people to play this position as black because you have far less space with the pawn on f4 and there's a lot of things you have to watch out for here as black and often you have to play a little bit more passively maybe do the maneuver with the bishop sitting on g7 and slowly wait for your opportunity um, to 
you know, to break open the position. But what I would recommend instead after the move queen to d3 is the move knight to c6. I think this is a little bit more active and it leads to a slightly easier position for black to play. So after the move knight to c6, most often white will capture, otherwise you will capture the knight or play knight e5. I recommend capturing with the pawn, but you can capture with the bishop as well. This is also playable. Let's say after the move, bishop goes to e3. You can play either bishop to b4 here, or you can consider playing the move h5 even. This is very interesting to put the knight on g4. So you can go into this, but I think it's not as sound as the move pawn takes. I think this is a lot better. White continues f4, let's say. Otherwise, it wouldn't be too challenging for black. And here, I think the best option for black is to go rook to d8. You can play the move bishop to c5 check, king h1, knight to d7, let's say e5, castles queenside. Queen g3, something along the lines of f5. You get into this type of position, which is playable for black, but I think white is also doing okay. So I recommend move rook to d8 instead. And let's say here after either queen h3 or queen g3, queen h3 is quite testing. After queen h3, I recommend the move pawn to c5, opening up our bishop. And white can go for the immediate attack with the move pawn to f5, which has been played in a number of different games. But black is scoring quite well here. I mean, black is um, rarely losing any games after even pawn to e5 or even pawn takes on f5 and for example a couple of games went back to d5 but here black can just take take bishop to d6 let's say castles bishop takes g6 and we can bring our bishop to e5 and black is doing fine here If instead to say bishop to g5 on move 14, then one game continued bishop to d7, queen takes f5, and here black can just play the move queen to d7, or castles queen d7. And after the queen trade, I think black is also doing fine in this position. So instead of queen h3, queen g3 has also been played. After the move queen to g3, again we can play the move pawn to c5, hitting the center, let's say bishop to f3, black has a number of different options here to try and get castle, we can just play the move pawn to g6, followed by bishop to g7 and castles in this position, and I don't see um, too many problems here for black, in one game it continued with move pawn to e5, knight to h5, queen to f2, and in this position Black could have just fiancadoed the knight, which looks a bit strange, but could have played knight g7 and brought the back, uh, brought the knight back to f5 here. Even maybe cons considering h5 to secure the knight on this square, and I think black has sufficient counterplay here, so so this is not a problem. Okay, well that concludes my look into the hedgehog from the black side. Um, if you have any further questions, do leave them in the comments below, and I will get to them. Otherwise, I hope you enjoyed the video and I'll see you on the next one. Take care.